A reading from the book of the prophet Hosea. Thus says the Lord, Return, O Israel, to the Lord your God. You have collapsed through your guilt. Take with you words and return to the Lord. Say to him, Forgive all iniquity and receive what is good, that we may render as offerings the bullocks from our stalls. Assyria will not save us, nor shall we have horses to mount. We shall say no more, our God, to the work of our hands. For in you the orphan finds compassion. I will heal their defection, says the Lord. I will love them freely, for my wrath is turned away from them. I will be like the dew for Israel. He shall blossom like the lily. He shall strike root like the Lebanon cedar and put forth his shoots. His splendor shall be like the olive tree and his fragrance like the Lebanon cedar. Again, they shall dwell in his shade and raise grain. They shall blossom like the vine and his fame will be like the wine of Lebanon. Ephraim, what more has he to do with idols? I have humbled him, but I will prosper him. I am like a verdant cypress tree. Because of me, you bear fruit. Let him who is wise understand these things. Let him who is prudent know them. Straight are the paths of the Lord. In them the just walk, but sinners stumble in them. The word of the Lord. I am the Lord your God. Hear my voice. I am the Lord your God. Hear my voice. An unfamiliar speech I hear. I relieved his shoulder of the burden. His hands were freed from the basket. In distress you called, and I rescued you. I am the Lord your God. Hear my voice. Unseen, I answered you in thunder. I tested you at the waters of Meribah. Hear, my people, and I will admonish you. O Israel, will you not hear me? There shall be no strange God among you, nor shall you worship any alien God. I, the Lord, am your God, who led you forth from the land of Egypt. If only my people would hear me, and Israel walk in my ways. I would feed them with the best of wheat, and with honey from the rock I would fill them. Dominus Fobiscum, Lexio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Marcum, One of the scribes came to Jesus and asked him, which is the first of all the commandments? Jesus replied, the first is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. 
There is no other commandment greater than these. The scribe said to him, Well said, teacher. You are right in saying, He is one, and there is no other than he. And to love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is worth more than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered with understanding, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And no one dared to ask him any more questions. Verbum Domini. We welcome our visitors, our pilgrims who are here. Another Father Joseph who is here with a group from Willington, Willington, Delaware, as well as some Denver, Colorado pilgrims. We'd love to see a lot of pilgrims come this year in this time of the Eucharistic revival. What better place to go than the Shrine of the Most Blessed Sacrament in this time of the revival, in fact, you may know that there's four pilgrim routes traveling with the Blessed Sacrament from the West Coast, the East Coast, from Northern Minnesota, from the tip of Southern tip of Texas, and they're all converging in Indianapolis. And the group that is coming with the Blessed Sacrament from Brownsville, Texas, will pass through the Shrine of the Blessed Sacrament in July, but we'd welcome any pilgrims to come, especially during this year, this time of the Eucharistic revival, I assure you, you will not be disappointed in coming here. I also wanted to thank all of you who've written cards and letters and kind notes, masses and prayers uh, since the passing of my mother. I've read all of them and uh, really have the sense that as Mother Angelica would say, that we really are family. So thank you uh, one and all. Forty years ago was the death, the passing into eternal life of a man in which there's a, a new renewed interest in his life. Father Walter Chizek, he's a servant of God. His cause is being considered in Rome for canonization and in my opinion, rightly so. But he died on December 7th, 1984 sitting in his chair because of the emphysema he had from being in the Russian mines with his rosary in his hand and the last words that he wrote in his diary, I have given all for you, my Lord. And truly we can see that in his life. Growing up in Shenandoah, Pennsylvania, and then later becoming a missionary to the Soviet Union, but being discovered as a priest there and spending some 23 years there, much of it in prisons, in solitary confinement for a time, and in the slave labor camps in Siberia. And it was on October 12, 1963, he had finally been released. There was an exchange of prisoners between the US and Russia. And he was one of those released from Russia. And so he ar arrives in New York on October 12, 1963. And his superiors wanted him to write about his experiences. And so he wrote his book in 1964 with God in Russia. But he said that in his prologue to the book, He Leadeth Me, he said that that really wasn't the book he wanted to write. He wanted to write about how he had learned so much from the deprivations that he had suffered there in the Soviet Union in the prison camps. He had been stripped of everything physically 
and in some cases spiritually, that there was a time, a period of time, I think it was five years when he was in solitary confinement, when he couldn't offer mass. And he said that this hunger was just as great as the physical hunger, which was a constant companion of him and those who were prisoners as well. It just became this deep feeling of deprivation. He would say the masses of the mass or the prayers of the mass, but he said that perhaps even intensified my sense of not having the Eucharist. But he wanted to write this book, He Leadeth Me, and this was printed on his own initiative in 1973. And here's what he said, the reason he wanted to write this one about the, the things he learned spiritually during that time. And I think probably many of you can relate to some of the things that he says. He said, I felt that I had learned much during those years of hardship and suffering that could be of help to others in their lives. For every man's life contains its share of suffering. Each of us is occasionally driven almost to despair, to ask why God allows evil and suffering to overtake him or those he loves. I had seen a great deal of suffering in the camps and the prisons in those around me and had almost despaired myself and had learned in those darkest of hours to turn to God for consolation and to trust him alone. And when newsmen asked him, how did you survive? He said, God's providence. And so in this book, he spells out how God provided even in this experience of terrible desolation. And in fact, he said he wonders during that time of solitary confinement when he couldn't celebrate mass, where he came to the brink of despair, if it, had been, if it would have been so deep if he had had the Eucharist. But I wanted to read just a short section where he talks, and this is chapter 13, the meaning of the mass. So you are here today. This is a time of the Eucharistic revival. And I think Father Walter Chizik, the servant of God, has much to teach us. I was so pleased when I was traveling throughout Iowa to the high school there in Dyersville and the Basilica to see that adoration is springing up in different places. When I was in Florida recently, likewise, to see these places where people are having adoration. Seems the revival is having an effect and people are encountering the Lord and the strength that only he alone can give. And so here's Father Chizek in this chapter, The Meaning of the Mass. So this is, he's talking about he had been deprived of the Mass for so long this hunger that he had for the Eucharist. When I reached the prison camps of Siberia, so he gets transferred to the labor camps in Siberia, I learned to my great joy that it was possible to say mass daily once again. It's, the prisoners were able to smuggle wine and bread for the celebration of the mass. In every camp, the priests and prisoners would go to great lengths run risks willingly just to have the consolation of the sacrament. For those who could not get to Mass, we daily consecrated hosts and arranged for the distribution of communion to those who wished to receive. Most often, we said our daily Mass somewhere at the work site during the noon break. Despite this added hardship, and they couldn't be discovered or they would be punished. Everyone observed a strict Eucharistic fast from the night before. At that time, you had to have a Eucharistic fast from midnight until the reception of Holy Communion. Everyone observed a strict Eucharistic fast from the night before, passing up a chance for breakfast and working all morning on an empty stomach. 
yet no one complained. In small groups, the prisoners would shuffle into the assigned place, and there the priest would say mass in his working clothes, unwashed, disheveled, bundled up against the cold. We said mass in drafty storage shacks, or huddled in mud and slush in the corner of a building site foundation of an underground. The intensity of devotion of both priests and prisoners made up for everything. There were no altars, candles, bells, flowers, music, snow white linens, stained glass, or the warmth that even the simplest parish church could offer. Yet in these primitive conditions, the Mass brought you closer to God than anyone might conceivably imagine. The realization of what was happening on the board, box, or stone used in place of an altar penetrated deep into the soul. Distractions caused by the fear of discovery, which accompanied each saying of the Mass under such conditions, took nothing away from the effect that the tiny bit of bread and the few drops of consecrated wine produced upon the soul. Many a time as I folded up the handkerchief on which the body of our Lord had lain and dried the glass or tin cup used as a chalice, the feeling of having performed something tremendously valuable for the people of this godless country was overpowering. Just the thought of having celebrated mass here in this spot made my journey to the Soviet Union and the sufferings I endured seem totally worthwhile and necessary. So I never let a day pass without saying mass. It was my primary concern each new day. I would go to any length, suffer any inconvenience, run any risk to make the bread of life available to these men. Profound words. And when we think about the scriptures today, in today's psalm, we really have a foretelling of the Eucharist, Psalm 81. And Psalm 81 talks about the infidelity of the people, that God's inviting them to himself, but in their stubbornness of heart, they wouldn't listen, so he let them follow their own designs. And we heard these words, if only my people would hear me and walk in my ways, I would feed them with the best of wheat, a foretelling of the Eucharist that satisfies our heart's deepest longings. And what did we hear from the prophet Hosea today? He said, you've collapsed through your guilt. Return to the Lord. Assyria foreign powers are not going to save us. We shall say no more our God to the work of our hands. And what happens when we return to the Lord? Hosea says, I will heal their defection. I will love them freely, freely, not constrained, not in a calculated or measured way. I will love them freely. That's what we experience in the Eucharist, that he gives us in this humble way, this communion, this union with him. He loves us freely, and he waits for us to love him freely in return. And in today's gospel, where our Lord ties these two commandments in the Old Testament together, to love the Lord the, our God with all our heart, mind, soul, soul and strength, but our neighbors ourself. But do you know at the Last Supper, he also ties those two together? But he actually raises loving our neighbors ourself to a higher level. Here's what he said at the Last Supper, John chapter 15. This is my new commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. 
Greater love has no one than this, than someone lay down his life for his friends. Love one another as I have loved you. Not just love your neighbor as yourself. Yes, do that. But love one another as I have loved you. There's no greater love than to lay down your life for your friends. And then he goes on to say, I call you friends. I chose you. Love one another. John chapter 15. I'm the vine, you're the branches. But what else happens at the Last Supper? So he gives us this new commandment to love one another as he has loved us. He institutes the Eucharist. And this is what enables us to be able to love in a far greater capacity than we could possibly do just on our own natural abilities. That's why we need the Eucharistic revival. We need to know this great treasure that Father Walter Chizek came to this deeper understanding through the deprivations that he had. That's all he had, but it was enough to sustain him. And so it is for us that it is this in the institution of the Eucharist that he enables us then to love God with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our soul, all of our strength, and to not just love our neighbor as ourselves, but to love as he has loved us, even laying down our lives for one another as Father Chizek did. He dies because of his devotion to Our Lady with his rosary in his hand. The last words that he wrote, may they be our last words in some way. I have given all for you, my Lord. 